it will be again it will be um, uh, about uh, complexity in computational social linguistics in particular we will explore the interplay between um, uh, geography um, culture and the social fabric so to get into it, I will start with a very general introduction to give you uh, the context and then the uh, methodology that we will be uh, using throughout the um, other project I will show you. So first, to start off, I will come back to language itself, which is our object, main object of study. Um, so the first thing uh, I would like to say about language is that it's a uh, cultural uh, universal, meaning that in every known uh, human culture, um, there is some sort of language around. And um, this uh, concept of language has existed for uh, around tens of thousands of, of years. So um, naively, um, given these two facts, one may think that since you have um, many individuals who, who interact with, with one another, speaking some language, and this for a very long period of time, it would expect uh, a huge diversity, which is the one we see today, between languages, but also uh, within them. Uh, however, everyone knows that in the past centuries, especially in the, uh, the last one, there's been, um, like the world has become much more interconnected. So uh, one might also uh, think that the more people are going to be interconnected, the more uh, language would tend toward uh, a state of uh, optimal communication, let's say, in which it would be completely homogeneous. So people would, uh, everyone would understand each other perfectly and there wouldn't be any uh, barrier, uh, language barrier anymore. So, um, however, language is not just about uh, communication. I mean, through communicate, every communication also has some context, especially a social one. And there are many different, so in return, there are many different aspects that uh, can shape language itself. The first one I want to uh, touch on is uh, culture, because we uh, we have um, and many cultural traits uh, themselves, which are embedded within uh, languages. And it's so much the case, but actually the UNESCO consider it um, uh, part of our cultural heritage. And if you take a um, very uh, objective economist view, you can think of language just as a commodity because it's a skill that people possess and um, therefore it has some value on the market. And this leads um, uh, people because they have different uh, languages speaking differently, etc., to uh, have different amounts of what's called uh, linguistic capital as uh, Pierre Bourdieu uh, coined it. And um, the last aspect I want to talk about is politics, because of course, if language is so important, um, it's um, a political subject. And um, so citizens and politicians can have some language ideology, uh, which could push for different things. Uh, at one extreme, you would have, uh, have um, uh, a push for homogeneous language, uniform language, to form unity within a nation. And on the other extreme of the spectra, you have uh, policies which, which could also uh, strive for uh, preserv preservation of the uh, local languages. Um, okay, so now that I've shown you very briefly that there is um, a lot of uh, complex uh, interaction going on in, uh, but basically, um, mm, yeah, language uh, happens in a um, uh, complex network of interactions, which itself is embedded into a social, uh, complex social context. How can we how can we study uh, the interaction between uh, these two things: society, so, so, social features, and um, and uh, language, which is social linguistics. So first, um, our um, um, bet here is that we are going to. Uh, do this in two steps, two basic steps. The first thing we want to do is to make some observation. So we always start from an observation. So we're going to observe uh, speech production in various uh, social settings, analyze them with some computer computational tools, hence the computational in the title. And uh, this will lead us to get, um, if we're lucky, to get some interesting patterns which we want to, um, uh, that we want to then explain because um, it's not only, I mean, it's nice to have an observation, but then uh, another thing is to understand what leads to this uh, 
what could lead, lead to the emergence of the patterns that we observe. So to do so, we uh, also strive to do some modeling. Here, uh, the kind of modeling I'm talking about is uh, one which, is, which consists of very simple models, which, I mean, the aim of these models is not to predict, it's not like a large language model or whatever, it's to understand, so uh, to uncover some the underlying mechani mechanisms that lead to the emergence of whatever we observed. So it's, uh, in this sense, it's kind of a complexity science or physics-like uh, model. So as I said, the first step is uh, we want to uh, find some patterns in the, uh, regarding speech production. So the first thing we need is some data on speech production, of course. So to touch on the various, some example da data source that we could use, uh, historically, historically, sorry, uh, you have um, published um, content, which has been uh, studied a lot. So either books, articles, or even more recently blogs, um, which in amount is uh, rather nice because people have been compiling a corpora of such, uh, from such sources for, for a long time. So you have a large compiled corpora of it. However, this is usually very highly biased because uh, well, the people who write books, who write articles, who write blogs are mostly part of the elites. It's starting to be less true, but, uh, um, but still uh, is mostly the case. And you have four more genres in there. So you don't have uh, the most natural speed production that you want to, to observe. Uh, then another, which is uh, favored by linguists mostly, um, is uh, to do interviews because in this case you control completely the bias that you're going to have in the data. I mean, because if you do things correctly, you sample the uh, like you interview the right people, then uh, you shouldn't have any bias and you should observe exactly what you want to observe. However, this is very costly, hence the uh, very limited amount of data that we have based on this. And finally, and as, as you can guess, which is the option that uh, will interest us here very social media data. So um, the nice thing being here, that you have uh, very large amounts of data publicly available, mostly. Um, but there is still a little bias, of course, because not, especially in developed countries, not everyone has internet access. And in, develop, in developed countries too, there is a bias because, um, well, these platforms are uh, aimed for a certain audience and they don't necessarily attract the, the whole population. But still, it's um, the compromise that we, we have taken uh, throughout the whole uh, thesis. And uh, that has been used in many uh, social linguistic works, uh, computational social linguistic works, especially. And here we will uh, consider in particular Twitter. Um, um, and uh, in all of the works I will show you using a database of geotag tweets that were posted between 2015 and 2021. Okay, so here is um, the base, like the base, the, I'm sorry, the uh, basic block of uh, the Twitter data, so the tweets. Um, <clears throat> so the speech production related uh, part is well, the text of the tweet, what the person has posted on the, on the social media. And the first step that we will always do uh, during these works is to uh, clean this text because it can contain uh, hashtags, URLs, or mentions of uh, other users, which are not like natural speech production, let's say. Then every time we will also do uh, some language detection um, and some other steps, which will be different every time, to get some feature of interest. And a second part that we, I mean, a second piece of data that we will use every time is the uh, geotag. So these are mostly, because of the time we, uh, on which we have the data, these are mostly places. So here, for instance, it's a city. It can have many different sizes. And um, we will have, um, in every work, some kind of grid, I mean, special division. So we have cells, and we refer to them as cells. And these places are just boxes like this in, uh, in yellow. And to, um, like attribute geographically whatever we observed to uh, these cells, we will use some partial attributions, meaning we will use the uh, ratio of intersected areas to uh, match them partially. And then um, whenever we want to uh, 
uh, assign a set of, re of residents to the users in our data set. We will uh, use first this attribution of tweets and also the tweeting times, which are available to uh, determine this set of residents using some heuristics that I will not detail here. Okay, so this is all for uh, the data. Now, um, what kind of modeling we do? Um, so we, what we want is to formulate the uh, most flexible possible um, uh, kind of model. And that's why we use uh, agent-based models every time. So in these models, uh, every agent, every person will have some linguistic state uh, denoted by uh, colors here. And um, they can switch from one state to another based on their interactions with other people. And so the nice thing about agent-based models is that you can change this network of interactions uh, however you want. The only formulation of, in the model is uh, the transition probabilities from one state to another. However, this is, so this is nice for uh, simulation when we have uh, real data to um, initialize it on. However, you also in most works, we also want to get some analytical results. Uh, so a more tractable form, which will be a, a differential equation. Uh, an evolution equation, sorry. And in this case, we will make some approximations, namely uh, the mean pair approximation to consider everyone fully connected. And um, yes, this will allow us to get some analytical results math math from mathematical derivations of, um, so to study, to have some insight about the uh, behavior of the model in the simple, simple settings. And then in the middle, there's a middle ground, uh, which is a meta population framework. So in these, um, to um, model the interactions between people, you put them in uh, in cells, I'd say, and they can move from one to the other to interact with different uh, populations. And when you make some simplifications, you can also get some analytical results. Okay, so that's it for the <clears throat> very uh, general methodology. Now to get into uh, one application, the first one, which will be about um, uh, multilingual societies. So here we will study uh, languages as um, uniform units, like uh, there's no variation within languages, we just study them as uh, units. And so we will study the diversity of multilingual societies. Um, um, because we uh, started from the question, the wondering about um, this thing that I've told you that people are more and more inter interconnected. So um, since language is so important in a society, can you have multiple languages coexist or not? Um, which is of interest to uh, many people. Or in the end, we necessarily tend toward the uh, homogene homogenization of language, which would mean a uh, mass extinction of languages. So this is, yeah, as I've just said, a topic of interest for linguists, but it has also been for the past two decades roughly um, um, of interest to physicists, mainly um, regarding the uh, modeling of language shift. So how people will uh, abandon a language uh, from one generation to the next, etc. One prime example of these kind of models, which led to many uh, subsequent works, is the one by uh, Abrams and Strogas in 2003. So this is a model where they just consider uh, two populations, one of, I mean, two, two languages, and people can either be monolinguals in one language or in the other one. And so um, it is a very simple model, which considers one, the prestige of uh, the languages. So how much uh, the language is favored within a society compared to the other one. So by the global institutions, the state, by education, etc. cetera. And um, also another parameter that I will not touch on very much, which is called volatility. Um, and so this worked out a lot of impact because they um, match or well, they fit their uh, model to some data, uh, like here in this example by the, my, the use of uh, Welsh um, in Wales, which uh, was declining. And so they um, fit the model and predict the, the death of the language in, uh, within a few decades of uh, the publication. Um, but here we wanted to uh, study more um, more of the diversity of multilingual societies because considering just monolinguals, for example, might not be enough. And so we first um, need an observation to quantify the diversity somehow to then evaluate these kind of models under uh, a new light. So uh, how we would do so? And so as I've said before, we just infer the language of our geotag tweets 
we match users to uh, cells and we get a special distribution of language use in uh, a number of societies. Here we are more than 15, but I will just show you, show you a couple of examples. So out of the um, Twitter data analysis, the basic uh, measurement that we get is just the number NLI, which is just the uh, number of individuals belonging to uh, the language group L, which can be monolingual uh, in one language, bilingual, trilingual, etc. In each of our uh, square cells I. So we just define a uniform grid over the regions of interest. And um, um, so yeah, a uniform grid of uh, square cells. What we want to do then is um, to measure some kind of um, how much mixing varies in these uh, areas, or uh, the other way around, how much segregation varies between these groups. And we do so uh, by uh, considering segregation as a departure from uh, a null model in which you would have people distributed. Um, uh, exactly like the whole population, no, ma no matter their language group. Like it will, this distribution would be independent of the language group. And to do so, we use uh, just to map this thing uh, in every cell to see how much people mix in every cell. We use uh, what we call uh, the uh, proportion entropy. So here we uh, get a proportion of speakers uh, who speak the language L in each cell, which is divide dividing by the population of, um, of the cell. And we compute this uh, very simple entropy. Then we just compute the ratio with its value uh, given uh, the global proportions. And this gives us some measure of the, the mixing in each cell i. To illustrate what information this gives us, here are two maps of uh, our paradigmatic examples of Belgium and Catalonia. So here in Belgium, I have drawn the uh, border between uh, Flanders and the north, where people speak almost exclusively Flemish, and in Wallonia and the south, where people speak almost exclusively French. And here is the Brussels regions. And as you can see, um, since the value of one means uh, no segregation, so per, like perfect mixing, let's say, uh, what you can see is that most in most of the country, people don't mix at all. Like the two language groups, sorry, don't mix at all, except slightly on the border and in Brussels, and this, in this area here where people speak a bit of German. Um, but so yeah, you get uh, this very linguistically segregated society, let's say. While in uh, Catalonia, you have the exact opposite. So people speak um, Catalan and um, and Spanish in um, kind of uni uniformly. There's no uh, segregation in that sense. We will see mostly because of uh, a large population of bilinguals, but yeah. Um, I'd like to mention also that in the thesis, um, we have presented a metric called the uh, Earth, Movers, Earth Movers Ratio. And I, I won't present here because it takes too much time. It's not very visual. But anyway, we have a way of quantifying this, uh, how much people mix. Um, and we did it for like uh, several regions of interest. Now, uh, so we have these two interesting patterns which are completely different. And so we would like to know um, what are the mechanisms that lead to emergence of one or the other one? Uh, what changes between the two? So to do so, yeah, we will consider an agent-based model of language shift. So here agents have uh, belong to uh, one uh, language group, which can be monolingual <clears throat> in A or in B, or in the middle here uh, can be bilinguals. And so the first, we, we will define two kinds of processes. The first uh, relating to uh, losing the language, which is done by uh, the passing of generations, so people dying. So we have this mortality rate, mu. In which means that uh, when one person uh, disappears, their offspring might keep their language or not, because we just do a one for one replacement to simplify things. So we have a fixed population. And then for uh, the transitions to learn a new language, uh, this is um, controlled by a parameter C. So the higher this parameter, the easier it is to learn a new language. For example, if the two languages are very similar, this would be higher. And then uh, in all terms, you have uh, the prestige that I mentioned before. So the global one, here the prestige of A. So for example, the more prestigious A is, the more people will want to uh, keep A or to, learn, to um, learn it. Also, there is a term of like social influence. So for this terms uh, P. So for example, PA will be the proportion of monolinguals A, allowing contact with uh, the agent. And this just means that the more people here around them uh, language A, the more they will want to uh, switch to it. 
So this is uh, for uh, monolinguals. However, for bilinguals, there is a term every time in front of this BAB, which is uh, Q. So this is the like the original thing about our model here. Um, so it modulates the influence of the bilinguals because they might prefer to speak uh, one language over the other one for cultural reasons or, uh, or others. <clears throat> and I will see if this is crucial for um, um, some kinds of coexistence that we observe. So uh, we will start to understand uh, if this model reproduces what we wanted to, um, to understand. We'll start with a stability analysis in mean field of the, um, sorry, the stability analysis of the equations obtained in mean field, which gives us these uh, three kinds of uh, convergences. So here I show uh, the PAPAB state and where um, uh, the model would converge to and if the point is stable, it's in blue. And so you can see that for a neutral uh, prestige and a bilingual preference and a rather low value of the learning rate, the only possible convergence table states are the ones where one of the two languages disappears. And there's only monolinguals in one of the two languages. Then when you increase a bit this learning rate, um, you get this point in the middle emerging at a stable one, which means that you have uh, the free population still uh, surviving. And um, more interestingly, even you have this third state in which you have a, so in this case, we have a dissymmetry. So uh, A is favored um, like globally by society, by institutions, but bilinguals prefer uh, B. And in that case, we have um, the language B will actually survive only through the bilinguals, A, B, and through a rather small population. Um, which is a, uh, like a remarkable result from uh, this model. Okay, but so this is this was just uh, we basically have two kinds of um, of solutions of the model in uh, a single population uh, as I've just shown you. So we have ex extinction of dominance or complete mixing of uh, of at least two groups. But what we started from was an observation in space. So we want to uh, then complex make things a bit more uh, complex and uh, put the, simulate the model in space. So we use uh, the meta population framework to do these simulations. So we consider that agents will have a uh, home and uh, work cell that in that, I'm sorry, and that in every step, they will uh, first go, will stay at home, interact with whoever they find there, then go to work and interact again with uh, different people, which may make them switch uh, languages. And so we <clears throat> iterate this model until we converge to a stable state and we observe what we get exploring the parameter space. And to spoil things a bit, the interesting things, thing, sorry, is that uh, not only do we have extension dominance or uh, perfect mixing, we also have a state where you have a spe special separation between uh, two communities. We have a very clear boundary which stays stable. And this is for especially low values of C as uh, the one here on the left, in this example. Where, uh, so we started with initializing the population according to uh, what we had in the data, took the commuting data to make people move around. And in the end, we uh, converged to, to this state where uh, basically the, board, we, the border stays stable more or less. And then on the other extreme, when you increase C, we can see uh, again, the state of complete mixing. So people speak as much French as uh, Flemish in every cell. Okay, so... Um, yeah, to wrap up uh, very quickly this uh, uh, the results we got here. So we started from geotag tweets and we obtained uh, distribution of languages in more than uh, 15 regions. But I didn't show, show here, but it's in the fields. Um, and the, the interesting patterns that we got out of it uh, are these very different um, special configurations of, uh, of mixing. And finally, we propose a model that includes the um, East Runner language, but also crucially the um, preference of bilinguals, which um, which uh, features, uh, like the remarkable feature is that we get uh, possible coexistence and um, the, the stability of a boundary when you include special interactions. Okay, so moving on. So as I told you before, uh, we have uh, considered languages as uh, completely homogeneous uh, units, like as, uh, um, 
as um, that there wouldn't be any variation within languages. However, this is obviously not true. This is the subject of study of the uh, second project I will uh, t tell you about. So um, here we will study variations within language and uh, in particular how people use different varieties re relating that to uh, their socioeconomic status. So there has been um, work by social linguists, in particular the seminar, seminar work by uh, William Laboff in 1966. And what he found is that by interviewing people in New York City stores of different um, like high-end stores and um, lower-end, let's say, stores, that there was, there was uh, some kind of um, variation, pronunciation variation based on the economic class. Like there was a very clear signal. And there has been uh, other subsequent work showing the, the same uh, tendency. And more recently, using a uh, data source closer to ours, there was this work by David Ball and others, where they use um, Twitter data in France and have shown that he, uh, the use of non-standard non language was cor <clears throat> correlated with uh, <clears throat> um, being of a low circumstance class, but there was also some geographical uh, variation. So here, um, <clears throat> The non-standard written language that we, uh, we uh, told you about is um, so in opposition with standard language, which is um, uh, the variety, like the one variety of language which is considered the correct one, or the one which is taught at schools that everyone uh, should know, uh, supposedly, um, and which is favored by uh, many different institutions. So we wanted to go into that direction, but do some um, to uh, bring some more understanding to this uh, phenomenon. So the first thing we did is to bring a, another um, uh, observation, let's say. So we wanted to uh, map uh, deviations from standard language using uh, the Twitter data that we have. Here we, we focused on England and Wales, and our special uh, partitioning is the um, well, the MSOAs is called, they are, it's like 7,000 administrative areas, which have a population of roughly uh, 8,000. So the first thing we did is from the data identify uh, people that we could uh, consider residents of one of these areas. And then to get deviations from standard language, we use this uh, grammar and spell checker uh, language tool, which for example, in this uh, applied on this famous sentence by uh, former French president François Hollande, would give us um, two matches. So there are two mistakes according to the, to the tool. Um, and uh, the tool not only says there is a mistake, it, also, it says also what kind of mistake it is. So it categorizes them. Here we have uh, a grammar mistake because there's just a verb missing. And um, this allows us to get the uh, frequency of deviations from grammar norms for uh, around 130,000 users that we identified uh, um, in space. And so here we chose, um, very briefly, we chose grammar mistakes because they were um, one, one of the most frequent ones, and two, very um, telling of um, the use of non-standard language, as opposed to, for example, typos, which could be, I don't know. Okay, so we had our first element, the uh, deviation from standard language, but then we want to relate it with some sort of socioeconomic indicator. So we will use the the fact that we identify the uh, area of residence of our users and assign them the uh, average net income of these areas that we get from the census. So this is what we show here on the x-axis related to the average frequency of mistakes of deviation from some language, uh, which is here on the y-axis. And what these data suggest, so here each point is a cell basically, is that we have um, a correlation uh, like a negative one, so the um, uh, the richer, the more standard people speak. But this correlation, which is um, also not very uh, high, um, changes can change a lot between uh, from one city to another. Like when we focus just on the metropolitan area of Sheffield, there is basically no correlation to see here. And so that's uh, something we wanted to uh, understand further, adding another feature that could explain it. And that's when we uh, thought of looking at the assortativity. So the tendency of people of different uh, classes to mix with uh, another class, uh, no, sorry, with the, with the same class. 
So this is this like the opposite, the opposite of social mixing, in a sense. So we defined uh, five economic classes, which are uh, made in a way that we have equal, equal population in each of them, measured this assortability in each city using the mobility that we had from the geotag grids. So this is what's shown here on the uh, x-axis for each of these cities, these eight cities. And on the y-axis, you have the um, correlation between um, so socioeconomic status and the uh, frequency of deviations as the ones I've shown you before in the insects. And um, interestingly, what we get remarkably out of it is that the more you have different classes uh, mixed with one another, the less conforming to standard rules will depend on the uh, uh, class of origin. So for example, in Bristol, the assortativity is high, so people don't mix too much. And the, um, uh, like the frequency of making uh, grammar mistakes depends a lot on uh, the social economic status. Okay, so <clears throat> we have this um, pattern again. The next step is we want to uh, understand it. So we have a very simple model of uh, switching between language varieties. Here there's just two varieties, so non-standard and standard, and two classes, the poor people and the rich. So the classes are um, shown here in um, different shapes, so circles and triangles, and the variety they used by whether the, the shape is filled or not. And so through their interactions with people, with, with someone speaking a, a different variety, they may switch to the other one. So um, the first parameter that I will mention is uh, LV, which is the S of before. So it's what is called the overt prestige. Here instead of the variety two, so the standard language. Um, the difference with the model of before, however, is that here you will have preferences again for one variety or the other, but this will depend on like an underlying state of the agents, which is their social economic class, which does not vary uh, in time. It always stays the same. <coughs> Sorry. And so you have uh, Q1, the preference of class one for uh, uh, variety one, so their variety in some way, and Q2, the preference of the richer for variety two. And then to have some interesting patterns of interactions, we have a mobility matrix. So it's just, uh, the elements are just the uh, probability for someone residing in a cell I to move to another one of cell J to randomly interact with someone uh, they find there. Now, what happens when we um, uh, put this model in infield again, with one connected? Uh, well, first we made some simplifications to reach to some um, equations. Um, so we consider that the two classes will be completely separated in two cells, that they have the same population and the same probability to go out of their cell. And the um, variable that we are interested in are these PKs, which are uh, the proportion of each class of using their own variety. And so what I want to highlight here is that we have, we have to, uh, a, comp a competition sorry, between two effects. The one relating, related to mobility, which will push uh, P1 towards one, one, P1 towards one minus P2. So it basically smooths out the linguistic differences between the classes. And then there's a second term here in green, uh, which I guess call of self, self growth, which depends on um, relative preference of uh, this class for their own variety. Uh, like relative to the, the prestige. And this one will push people toward the extremes of um, completely using one variety or, or the other one. Um, now, what this implies um, is that when we uh, here set, so the preference of uh, people of class one over for variety one rather high, and we vary this uh, value of the, the over prestige. We have that when it's uh, very low, well, everyone will end up speaking um, uh, the variety one. When it's uh, quite high, everyone will speak a variety two. And for values in the middle, people with you know, the two classes will use the two varieties. But obviously, since uh, people of class one prefer one, they will still speak it a bit more. And um, in this last panel, the panel D, what I show is uh, for like how this blue point, the stable fixed point, moves in the uh, P1, P2 space for different values of Q1. When we increase um, the value of M, so in other words, when we decrease the assortativity. 
And so what this shows is that, as I said before, the more you increase this mobility, the more we will tend towards uh, this dashed line, which corresponds to P2 equals one minus P1. So um, the more mixing, the more uh, the differences are smoothed out. So which is consistent with uh, our, obs our observations, at least in this very basic setting. Now, if we want something more, um, a bit more complex, if we uh, do some uh, simulations using the real population from the census, um, our measured mobility, and um, in this case, we will again consider five classes, not two. So to um, limit the phase space exploration to just three parameters, we will make a, a very simple uh, approximation. We will just consider uh, Q1 and Q2, and to get the variety, uh, sorry, the preference of each class for variety one, we'll just take a linear interpolation between uh, uh, Q1 and one minus Q2, which is the uh, one minus Q2 is the preference of the richest class for variety one. And so here on the left, I show you again what we had in the data, the main result uh, from our observations. And the right, on the right, one example simulation. Um, and what you can see, well, with the difference that on the y-axis, here we put um, uh, as a proxy for um, the frequency of making uh, mistakes according to our tools. Here we measure the proportion of people speaking variety one, so non-standard in each cell at the end of the simulation. And so we don't have the same <clears throat> values, range of values on the y-axis, but the, what we are interested in is more the tendency uh, when you compare it, um, plotted versus the uh, assortativity. And so strikingly, we get the same kind of behavior. The more um, people will mix together in these cities, even with the real mobility, the more, um, uh, like the less the, uh, the use of uh, one variety will depend on their uh, social uh, economic class. Okay, so that's um, um, what I wanted to show as four results. To uh, wrap up, we, have, we had some, um, measurements of how much people deviate from standard language in England and Wales. And you, relating it to mobility assertivity, we found that the more there is uh, social mixing, the less in interdependence between uh, the use of uh, non-standard language and the economic class. And second, we came, came up with a national based model, which models the adoption of different varieties, which uh, has captured well this effect, both analytically, but also in more uh, realistic simulations. Okay, now for uh, the final uh, work that I, I wish to present here, um, I will talk, talk about um, cultural regions. So this time we are uh, studying the cultural dimension. And, um, yeah, as I've said before, um, cultural identity is related to language, but also to many different things, um, which can be social economic status, the origin of birth of people, their, uh, their religious affiliation. And um, there are many people who strive to map cultural differences, um, especially geographers, because they can help better understand uh, differences in the country, especially regarding uh, politics or uh, or sensitive uh, topics. However, since there are so many dimensions which could define uh, someone's cultural identity, it's very hard to select some features that are representative and how much each one would weigh in their uh, the definition of their culture. So that's why in past studies that I've shown here, there is no uh, agreement on the extent or even the number of cultural regions here in the US, which will be our case study. Um, so yes, here, uh, the approach we take to this problem of mapping cultural differences is that we, we will um, detect these regions in like automatically. So we want to uh, not only identify the regions, but also what defines them and not define it a priori ourselves. Um, and our hypothesis starts from uh, language itself. So we will uh, leverage the fact that uh, cultural identity should be reflected, or at least part of it, should be reflected in uh, the way people speak and what they speak about. And so our approach is to use uh, uh, all of our data, so our geotag tweets, and we use some methods of dimensionality reduction and data clustering to infer regions. 
So uh, the starting point, again, are the attack tweets. So we match them this time to a, a county of the US, so one of the 3,000 counties of the US. And what we get in each of these counties are these frequencies FCW. So we just look at the top 10,000 content words, which are denoted W, and we uh, compute the relative frequency of each word W in each county C. Now this data is very um, quite noisy, so the first step we take is to uh, measure some local spatial autocorrelation uh, using this metric called uh, get this old uh, GI star, which leads us to uh, another metric, so this one of uh, GCWs. And what this um, metric tells us is uh, through um, like a specialized moves this call, so just uh, a deviation from the mean divided by the standard deviation of the frequencies. Um, we get, um, so for positive, positive values of this metric, the, it, it means that we have relatively high frequencies of usage of the word W around the county. And if it's inferior to zero, there are re relatively low ones. And in this case, we take a very uh, simple special smoothing, which is just of taking, uh, of considering the 10 nearest neighbors of each county when we compute uh, the metric. And so to just give you uh, some examples, uh, so there's a common word where you don't see very, any meaningful pattern. And then uh, on the other end, we have uh, some uh, vocabulary item from uh, African American vernacular English which shows you uh, very clearly the region uh, of the surface of the US, which is more or less the deep south, a bit extended. And so we have 10,000 of these maps. And uh, uh, as I've just said, not, every, not all the signal that we have in them is meaningful. Uh, so like not every word has some uh, cultural meaning. So the first thing that we do is a principal component analysis. So we go from uh, this space of uh, 10,000 dimensions down to one of 300. Then this allows us to, uh, when we project our data to this uh, new space, this allows us to uh, also compute distances between counties, like lexical distances, let's say. And um, we can then perform a, a hierarchical clustering to cluster together counties which have uh, similar lexical patterns. And this leads us to our uh, cultural regions which I show here. So here the map on the left is uh, our uh, division, the cultural division of the US with uh, five regions. And on the right, you have a dendrogram. So which shows which, uh, if you go all the way on the right, which goes on all the way to counties, which counties are grouped together uh, at each um, uh, clustering step. And so uh, we have five regions. I will talk about them a bit, uh, a bit more later. But the interesting thing that we can get looking at this map and the dendrogram is that you have um, a very strong divisions between the two two regions, the two blue regions, sorry, um, and the rest of the country. So um, basically, that we uh, the north versus south division is the uh, strongest one. But before show, um, speaking of each uh, cluster that we have, uh, I have to mention how we would like to infer what topics actually define them. It doesn't make sense at all. So to do so, we define the uh, specificity of each word regarding, uh, like with regard to a cluster. And this is just, um, so taking, going back to the, um, uh, the get this old uh, values that we had, um, um, taking the, so we take the first the center of each cluster. Um, and uh, do the difference between um, um, the closest cluster center. And um, so we just take one dimension, the one of the word, and we take uh, the difference between the two, um, the two elements, uh, uh, which are taken at the, at the center of the cluster. This was not clear at all, but let's get anyway. Uh, and uh, this leads us to get to getting the uh, most characteristic words, um, taking into account um, the words which have the highest uh, search specificity. So this get, gives us, for example, here for the cluster one, the one in blue, in dark blue, sorry, that we have um, 
a large influence of uh, African and American culture because you have, for example, lots of uh, forms for, from this vernacular form of English, of American English. And uh, cluster two, so, uh, which is around the Midwest, more or less, where there uh, are lots of mentions of uh, spectator sports. The next one, which interestingly is non contiguous, uh, as opposed to lots of previous studies, uh, which is in very rural areas or around uh, mountain ranges, where people speak a lot more about uh, well, cultural, uh, sorry, natural features and um, this kind of outdoor, outdoor sports. Uh, this fourth one, which is centered around a lot of big metropolitan areas on the coast of the US, uh, so kind of the richest areas and the most uh, politically integrated, um, where they mention where urban features, but more interestingly, they talk a lot more about politics and international issues. And finally, the cluster five, which is basically Texas and Oklahoma, where first we speak a lot about Texas. And uh, they are very influenced by Mexican culture. So, yeah, to wrap up this work, we uh, use again, a, a, this time, a very big corpus of geotag tweets, this time to leveraging the relationship between language and culture to uh, detect automatically some cultural regions without making any uh, a priori uh, choice of, uh, of features that define them. And the main result is that we find a very clear uh, no basis of distinction in the US and up to five uh, clear cultural regions, which can be even um, non contiguous, uh, according to our method at least. All right, so um, that's it for the results. Now I would just uh, conclude very briefly, starting with a, a summary. So to say just in a few words, we uh, every time what we wanted to do was to uncover some social linguistic pattern and the mechanisms that could explain them in very different contexts. So first, <clears throat> the process of language shift in some integral societies, the adoption of different uh, language varieties depending on the socioeconomic context of people, and uh, finally, the lexical relation in space, which could reflect uh, parts of cultural differences. Now, uh, as an outlook, so I think um, and I hope I've shown you that um, the results we got prove that using this uh, synergy of methods uh, from uh, data and complexity and science um, are very useful and powerful to study uh, this kind of uh, phenomena, which are purely very complex to study, even uh, especially on a large scale. Um, but there are, there, is a, there are, of course, Many more things to explore. We just explore just a few dimensions of variation. Um, for example, we could relate our um, the first and second uh, project I've uh, told you about um, because language use itself, so, um, being or, or even being bilingual, could have some relationship with uh, the economic class that we didn't study at all, and this could be completely different from one country to to the other, and from depending on the language as well. Second, um, regarding the last work, we could uh, apply it to uh, on a larger scale, let's say, to study more global cultural differences. So across countries, especially for languages which are spoken on different continents, like the uh, like English that I told you about, but also French, Spanish, or Arabic. And um, as a final point. There are many more dimensions of uh, language diversity that we didn't uh, explore at all. Um, mostly related to spoken language, for example, pronunciation, we didn't study it at all, um, dialects, or even uh, how speakers would adapt to context, and so change their language depending on who they uh, talk with. The issue being with all these uh, very interesting subjects, um what kind of data we could use to uh, to study them okay well that's it for me i wish to thank you for your attention and no <laughs> that's all thank you rosa uh, thank you very much for your presentation and now we have the session of discussion with the committee First, uh, I first I will ask uh, Professor Masi San Miguel to make any comment or question.
Uh, thank you, Russia. Uh, 